Thank you. So a little bit about the past. That's uh, that little boy over there is me when I was two years old. Yeah, the first time I went to, to the Cape, to Cape Canaveral. Um, some people ask me, well, how, how did you get into sending things up to space? And I have to say, well, it was pretty natural because at home, uh, in discussions with, with my dad, who's an astronomer, he studies planetary atmospheres, uh, I, I got the exposure to, to a world of possibilities. And since I was very little, I felt that that fascination and those possibilities should be shared and not just kept for those that are in the know. That everybody can be fascinated about space and everybody can also do business in space and do activities. And space should be open for all humanity. I'm from Granada, okay? Have you been to Granada? It's a wonderful city, lots of historical buildings. Uh, you can go to the beach, you can go skiing. And since you can go skiing, there are tall mountains, so there are telescopes. And that's why I was there, because my, my father was working with these telescopes to, to study, as I said, planetary atmospheres, the atmospheres of other planets. But how about the, the atmosphere of our planet, which re it's really, really important for us for our survival. So to study the atmosphere of our planet, he was sending rockets um, from Huelva, specifically from a place called El Arenosillo, okay, in Huelva. And these rockets were built in Spain. They reached 300 kilometers in altitude, and, and they worked. So a lot of people tell me, oh, you've been to MIT, so probably because you went to MIT, you, you got excited about space. No, no, no. All this stuff was going on here in Spain way back. We were building rockets. We were sending out balloons to space and so on. But, but for some reason, we, we kind of stopped. And through the private sector and through my company, I want to bring this back. Operation Farside, the Air Force space research project based on Eniwetok Island prepares for the launching oh, of the This is just before NASA was started, 1957. You see that balloon over there? The missile is a light 1900 pound four stage rocket. And the rocket? Not to orbit like the Sputnik, but to carry instruments higher than ever before attained. And Back in the 40s, it wasn't clear how to reach a space. People were trying different things. You see? It goes without a hitch. That rocket? They're not sending it from the ground. This brave man here, that wouldn't happen today, you know? We've become so worrisome. So here's the balloon going up to the edge of space, to the edge of the atmosphere, floating over there. And in America's development of an intercontinental missile, a height reached by the rocket, an estimated 4,000 miles. farthest stride into outer space. Shooting through the balloon is not needed, okay? It's not compulsory. You, you can go on the side. But hey, you see, back in the 50s, when it wasn't yet clear how to reach a space, people were trying to send things up on balloons. And it proved a lot more efficient. But it stopped, like so many things. The reason why it stopped is that it wasn't useful to carry a five-ton nuclear warhead from the United States to Moscow. <clears throat> the same is true for the Soviet Union. They wanted to basically bomb each other. And the fact that we can send things up to space so that we can enjoy watching football games or watching Game of Thrones or getting better weather or be getting all sorts of data, Internet of Things, all those things are coming, big data that are coming from space, we have them because we send things up to space, but we do it in a way like if it was the end of the world. We do it with rockets that were really designed to send nuclear bombs to each other. And five tons is, you know, is, is a lot of weight. And this method of using a balloon wasn't good for, for those big, big, big masses. But fast forward to the world of today. What is a satellite? A satellite in a way, it's a computer. Like, it's like a mobile phone. It's got some cameras. 
It can take pictures, it can send data, it has some sensors. And computers have shrunk. So now, satellites are a lot more capable in small packages. So this technique that was used back then starts making sense again. Because you can send little things up to orbit on using, using balloons as first stage. So, of course, rockets and satellites are not really what we're more, more familiar with, uh, as, as was said before. Uh, but, but you are all familiar with planes because you all use them. So take a look at the evolution of the computer and the airliner. So it's even more extreme with, with rockets, but, but there, there has been almost no progress <coughs> since the 50s. Of course, yeah, the seats are closer. <coughs> and, yeah. And, and, and the, there's many reasons why this is so. And, and a lot of them have to do with the fact that the main driving force back then was destroying the world, you know, keeping, destroying each other. But I believe that there are better ways to incentivize this. I believe that if we could get pictures of the Earth on, in all wavelengths or at any time, we, we would be safer, but we would understand better the planet, we would use better our resources. There's lots of things that, that can be done up there. We, you know, we, we have global problems, and the only reason that we understand that we have global problems is because we can see these things uh, and we can monitor these things uh, from a vantage point from space. You know, this is, uh, this is uh, Buzz Aldrin, the second man on, on the moon, and, and he, he, he said this uh, famous sentence, you know, you promised me Mars colonies and instead uh, I got Facebook. So, so we, or there's variations of that instead of got 140 characters. Or, um, and, and this doesn't have to be that way, you know? Space doesn't have to be only for big, big governments or only for extremely wealthy uh, James Bond-style supervillains. Space can be for everybody. There are startups making satellites, making, making engines, making new systems. Uh, everywhere. Here in, Sp in, in near Barcelona, there are several of them. They're not all in Silicon Valley. There's, they are in Berlin. They are, they, this is finally the space industry is becoming an industry that is accessible to everybody because the parts, the knowledge, the, the components have become affordable and smaller. So, for instance, this is a typical telecommunication satellite, and this is the future. This is a CubeSat, it's just one kilogram. And the standard for the CubeSat was, de was designed by this guy, Jordi Puigsuari, who's Catalan as well. And, and, and now this has grown into a full-fledged, there are hundreds of companies building those uh, small satellites based on mobile phone components. But the problem, why they can't really solve all these problems that I described, is that the transportation element is still the same as in the 50s and the 60s. It's still the intercontinental ballistic missile, sending that huge thing up there like if it was the end of the world. No way to reuse it, extremely hard to reuse, extremely inefficient. So we've designed a, a rocket based on knowing what worked in the past that is adapted to these small payloads that can deploy these payloads on demand. And some of you might think, oh, more space debris, more, you know, there is so much trash already in space, why do we want to send more things up there? So let me tell you something about that. Space debris is a problem, but it's a problem that comes from things that are really high, so they take hundreds of years to come back down. Anything that is in space is eventually going to fall back down if it's in orbit. And also, components get old, you know. Uh, your mobile phone, you don't use it for more than five years. So they get obsolete. You, you probably want to replace them. So traditionally, what we've done is we've sent these things to 36,000 kilometers. 36,000, that's really far away. Imagine driving 36,000. It's like driving around the world. So that's where we send them. And they take really, really, really long time to come back down. But the good thing is that up there, they stayed in one place. 
So it was easy. You can have a big antenna at the top of your house and look at that. Those are called geostationary satellites. And they cost hundreds of millions. It's like your ISPASAT or your Astra satellite. But imagine that this satellite, instead of being at 36,000 kilometers, it was at 360 kilometers. Okay? So that's 100 times closer. What happens there? Well, you need a lot less power to talk to it. Maybe your mobile phone cannot, doesn't can ha carry an antenna this big, but it can carry a little antenna and can talk to it. Maybe the, the resolution of the pictures that you're going to get from 360 kilometers is a lot better than the resolution that you could get if you were really, really far away for your pictures. There are many advantages, but they move. They move around the Earth, whereas the geostationary satellites, they, they stay in one place. So the solution is to build networks, to send hundreds of these satellites, and make sure that there is always one over you. So if you need a picture, if you need to communicate, whatever you need to do, there is always going to be one or several of them. And in order to build that network, you need a, a way to put those little satellites in the right places. And this is what we're doing. We're enabling those small satellites to go and be at the right locations around the world as they spin around so that they provide constant coverage. And this is Blue Star, our solution to do this. So this is a balloon, you see? It doesn't have any environmental impact. It's just helium. It floats. And it carries a rocket. But look at that rocket. It doesn't look like your traditional tin tin rocket or the rocket like the one that we saw in the 50s. A normal rocket is, is kind of pointy, even more pointy than this, because it has to go through the atmosphere. So it, in order to go fast through the atmosphere, it needs to be very, very thin and slender and pointy. And making something really pointy, uh, efficient, and piloting it and everything is, is quite hard. But if you can have something that that is a bit chubbier, if you will. You can have more efficient tanks, simpler engines, and a lower cost operation overall. So you break the problem in two. A normal rocket would shoot through the atmosphere at high speed to try to reach Russia in 15 minutes. We are not in a hurry to, to place our satellites. We can wait for one hour or an hour and a half to exit the atmosphere and then shoot into orbit. Here's a close-up. There are three stages, two stages with six engines, and then a, a final stage with one engine, which is identical to the, to the six of the, of the second stage. And there's all this volume here to put your satellite. You know, this is not the usual um, a startup that, that you hear, right? Uh, you don't hear much about, about these kinds of things. But, but flying cars, um, you know, high-speed vacuum trains, all those kinds of things are going to happen. And they're going to, they're not, we, don't, we can't wait for space agencies to develop them. We can't wait for governments to implement them. We can't wait for the European Commission to prepare a framework program or a, it's in the drive of the entrepreneurs and it's in the vision of, of the teams to make all these things which are totally possible happen. So here's a, a short video of how the, an operation of Blue Star is, is going to look like. The Canary Islands are the ideal place to perform these operations from.
So you do have engines, they burn natural gas, but they burn it out already outside of most of the atmosphere. So you're not really doing any emissions where it matters. So it's effectively a zero emissions space transportation system. So that's your satellite up there, but you can put different configurations, many smaller ones. They can be already open. They don't have to be packed in a little box. It's a much gentler ride. You don't have to go really, you know, at high speed through the atmosphere, break the sound barrier, all those kinds of things. It's a very gentle ride. And it doesn't go very far, it just goes into orbit. And the satellite will stay there for about the same time that its components are, are working. So, so these solar panels, these batteries, these sensors are going to last around five years. And, that, and then after five years, the satellite becomes a shooting star and falls back to Earth. This is not just computer graphics. We're building this. We, this is a test of, of an engine here in Igualada. This is a, a, a balloon being launched uh, uh, from, from Leon, okay, from, from an Air Force base in Leon. And, um, and, 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 and I, you know, I encourage you to, whatever is your passion, whatever is your dream, go and, and, and chase it and make it happen because uh, now with all the opportunities that we've, we've never had as, as a species, um, it's, um, it's, uh, there's no more excuses not to go. Thank you.